so welcome to this uh, seminar series, uh, the European American Collaboration on Wind Energy. This is organized by uh, uh, by Sue Ellen Haupt from NCAR and, and me. And uh, NCAR has kindly provided a, a website where the recorded uh, seminars can be seen. Uh, but this time, uh, I'd like to welcome Elliot Simon. And uh, he, he's going to talk about the GLOBE experiment, which took place in the North Sea. And uh, Elliot is a senior R&D engineer at uh, DTU, the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, and he was working on uh, advanced use of LIDARs and LIDAR data for wind energy, basically. He's involved in all areas of LIDAR hardware and software development and the full cycle of planning, executing, and understanding complex measurement campaign. Elliot combines over 10 years of practical experience in measurements with the latest research concepts and to advise and collaborate with the global wind industry and academic partners. He completed his PhD in 2019 at uh, DTU, and that included also a research stage with NCAR focusing on LIDAR-based middle-scale wind power forecasting. He's a native uh, Floridian, or how to, I don't know how to say that, but from Florida, yeah. uh, although he has since uh, followed his education through six countries to his current home in Copenhagen. And he speaks also Japanese, so uh, he has a quite a good background. And he also provides his uh, LinkedIn address in the bio. So please, uh, Elliot, proceed. Yeah, thank you very much, Jakob and Sue. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and, and to be able to speak with you. And in the true spirit of this of this collaboration, I'm sitting here in Florida uh, with my family at my family's house. So um, I'm going to talk today about a, pro a project that we've been working on for the past four years, which uh, has just concluded. And um, I think we've learned a lot, and I want to be able to share that with with the community here on on the global global scale of all the scientists and people involved in wind energy. So um, I'm going to talk about the advancements we've made in uh, offshore wind LiDAR measurement campaign design that have resulted from the global blockage experiment, which you're gonna call the GLOBE project. So again, my name is Elliot Simon, and uh, I also want to thank my collaborators on this project uh, from DTU, particularly Mike Courtney and Gunhild Torsen, and also very good uh, colleagues from RWE, Fraunhofer Evis, TNO, and the other GLOBE partners that are part of the project. So without further ado, I'm gonna dive in. So um, if we come back to 2019, uh, you know, prior to this time in the research community, a lot has been talked about and, and uh, researched about the uh, turbine induction effect and wind farm blockage. But it's really at this point in 2019 when the industry focus was brought to the blockage effect. And it was really started from a, um, a quarterly report, a financial report from uh, Ursa Wind Power that claimed or uh, made the proclamation that their wind power forecasts were inflated and they actually had to write down the value of their asset portfolio and of their production, uh, future production from their offshore wind farms. And they cited two main reasons, uh, the blockage effect and the wake effect. And this really started a, uh, a lot of conversations and you know a lot of uh, interest in understanding what this effect was and how to how to account for it in uh, the siting and um, project planning. So there was really a lack of consensus among the offshore developers about this blockage effect and uh, what scale, what implications it had on making production estimates. And at that point, most of the flow models that were being used by the developers, uh, didn't incorporate any physics from blockage and simply applied a loss factor at the end, somewhere between zero and 4% of the um, of the production. So there was really kind of, a, it was a bit of a catch-all uh, kind of at the end of the, at the end of all the estimations, it was sort of just a loss that, that they would include. So we knew that we could do better than this. And um, it was really this desire for, an observational data set of the blockage effect 
um, a validated model that incorporated the physics that had been observed from the from the observations, and then sort of a standardized approach that was developed uh, to quantify that effect by all of the major offshore wind developers. So they really wanted to, to reach consensus on understanding this and um, and basically how to uh, how to perform this um, resource assessment, including blockage. So then what became of that was uh, initiatives from RWE Renewables uh, through the Carbon Trust Offshore Wind Accelerator and the globe, uh, Global Blockage Experiment was born. And I'm gonna come into an organizational chart just to show you how many, uh, how well supported this project is. And um, we come, come into uh, basically the idea that, that we have a steering committee that includes funding and support from, from all of these developers who have been really instrumental in making this possible. So I want to thank them. And on top of the, uh, the developers, we've also had a technical committee um, of the developers and also the academic partners uh, that I mentioned earlier, who have really been instrumental as well in making this work possible. So um, uh, DTU's involvement and in, in me specifically has been to lead the planning uh, uh, of the offshore campaign, all of the preparation of the equipment, the measurement equipment that went into making uh, the data set possible and, uh, and processing all of that data for analysis. So um, just to give a high level motivation on the project goals of, of GLOBE. The first goal is to create the most robust and complete wind data set uh, possible with the current technology in order to study the blockage effect. And the second is to achieve consensus on the physics and, um, and how the blockage effect uh, can be accounted for in wind resource assessment and other, other processing uh, of wind data. So I'm gonna focus purely on the work that we've put into achieving the first goal here. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details about, about the project and what we've gotten out of the measurements themselves, but I wanna talk about um, all the work we've done to create, to create the high quality data set for that. So uh, stay tuned for a lot of uh, information coming out of, of the results of this project and con conclusions. We have some journal papers and conference presentations um, and a joint statement from all of the wind developers on um, on what we've uh, achieved, the consensus we've achieved on on this. So stay tuned for that. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the experiment and uh, and walk you through the the sort of methodology and line of thinking that we took in order to uh, to to actually plan the campaign and all the details that went into that. So the first thing is to know where in the world we are. Um, here we have Denmark and Northern Germany, and off the coast of Northern Germany in the North Sea, we have this island called Helgoland, and there's a cluster of four wind farms, uh, or yeah, four wind farms um, just north of that island that uh, is the site that we've done the installation. And all of these wind farms are owned and operated by RWE, which made it fairly simple from an operational perspective to um, to host the, the experiment there, but it's really an ideal position because you're far away from um, any mesoscale effects from long distance to the shore, you're far away from uh, other existing wind farms, and at the time in which we did the experiment, um, this was the layout, right? So we had Amram Bank West, uh, wind farm to the north, and then we had this gap, which was called the Kaskazi Gap, and is now a operating wind farm, but um, two years ago when we when we uh, did the experiment, this there were no turbines here. And what that gave us was really the option, uh, the opportunity for measuring wind, it, the same wind with the presence of the wind farm and without the presence of the wind farm. So um, that was really a, an ideal location for doing this kind of experiment. So we have uh, the Kaskazi Gap, and then we have another wind farm here called Nordsee Ost. So um, the presence of the turbines allowed us to install equipment there uh, and measuring, you know, in various regions around this site that I'm going to talk about in a moment. And lastly, we had a met mast uh, present here on, on the south corner um, of Nordsee Ost. And that met mast had actually been decommissioned pr previously, but uh, we were able to recommission it with new sensors and data loggers in order to 
uh, to gather data, uh, yeah, uh, in situ measurement data from the MetMast. Here's a nice photo I took, just want to show you uh, from that island Helgoland out to the wind farms cluster. And on a clear day, you can see the turbines. It's a very nice, nice place to be. I can recommend a visit. Okay, so we're going to start with the measurement objectives and, and kind of look through some of the options that we had at the beginning and kind of what our um, thought process was and how we ended up choosing the instrumentation and the, um, yeah, and the campaign design that we did. So the first goal here was to measure uh, specific positions around the site. And what we decided to do was to run various uh, flow models, CFD models, and, uh, and also simple analytical models, um, and try to figure out using different hypotheses of the blockage effect, how, um, how, how the models would differ between them. And where the results from the modeling diverge is where we focused our measurement position. So it's pretty clear to see you know that the uh, the area upstream of the first row is a primary interest, and also the area along the gap, along the Kaskazi Gap here. Um, and we had a couple issues. The first was that well, those areas were there were no wind turbines, so we couldn't simply do this from a, a turbine data perspective. We actually needed to have a measurement of of a place where there were no objects already existing. So that kind of ruled out some. Uh, some easy, easy uh, options. And then another, uh, another really important part here is that one thing that we were able to do, one assumption we were able to make and design this analysis was to use the relative wind speed ratios. So the ratios between points um, along in, within the site. So we're not using absolute wind speeds. We're using the, the wind speeds that are measured and then uh, taken relative to each other, and that's a nice trick that that we've able to been able to um, to use, which I'm going to go into when I talk about the uh, calibrations that really made things a lot simpler. So we started first by thinking, okay, uh, what are what are our options here? And uh, one, you know, very nice uh, easy thing would have been if we could place um, equipment like floating profiling lidars within those positions. You know, or meteorological mass, but unfortunately, uh, a, a large number of those of either of those would have been you know too expensive and challenging operationally to um, to run through a, a one year campaign. We thought about the satellite and airborne measurements, but they don't have the um, the spatial or temporal resolution needed in order to solve the problem we had. And um, we also thought about simple fixed geometry lidars that simply stare at one position that have sufficient range, but those haven't been available commercially. They may come soon, um, but at the time that which we did this, they weren't possible. So really what it led to our decision was, was the natural solution of a pulse scanning Doppler wind lidar. Um, and those were suitable for taking these measurements, but they're you know very complex and have a lot of of different uh, modes that you need to be very careful when you when you do the planning and when you're running the campaign, uh, you have to know what you're doing in order to be able to, uh, to to do this correctly. So we've decided then on the scanning LIDAR measurements um, and then complement that with the MetMast, refurbishing the, the MetMast as I mentioned and deploying one floating LIDAR, which was extremely uh, valuable within, within the project. So um, I think we've come to to the the least complicated uh, solution, but the one that matched the the needs of the project. So here's what we ended up with in the end. Um, here's a list of all the instrumentation. So we have six uh, scanning lidars, a WinCube 400S model. You can see that in in the photo here if you're not familiar. Um, and we placed those into dual Doppler pairs where the the lidars are functioning together as one unit and coordinating their beam. To measure, uh, to measure two um, independent views of the of the wind, and um, <clears throat> we've also included measurements that I'm going to go into why we've done this, but just for the sake of uh, of information, um, we've measured the transition piece motion using a couple different motion sensors: this two-axis inclinometer here and the three-axis IMU sensor, which measures. It's also a um, a gyroscope and accelerometer. 
So we're able to actually measure the, the transition piece motion where the LIDARs are installed on the turbines. Um, we've also added uh, boundary layer height measurements from another scanning LIDAR that's operating in ABL height mode. Um, we have also included a floating profiler li profiling LIDAR, which is a continuous wave ZX based uh, LIDAR. And that system has been moved between three positions in the wind farm that I'll point out. Um, and I should say that the ABL LIDAR and the, uh, the floating LIDAR have been operated by Fraunhofer Evis and were really uh, important in this project. And I would definitely recommend um, including those if you ever, um, you know, if you're planning a campaign of your own. Uh, we've also refurbished the MET mast with, um, with brand new sonic anemometers that also record temperature. So we have all the fluxes and the turbulence parameters derived from those from that data. The cup anemometers, wind vanes, um, a profiling LIDAR placed on the MET mast. And then we also have sea surface temperature via these infrared radiometers. So it's a, it's a huge amount of atmospheric data um, that we're measuring in the campaign. Um, in addition to that, we have all the turbines data at high frequency from, from the 128 turbines in the wind farm. Monitoring cameras that both allow us to, to view the operation of the equipment, but also uh, look back at certain use cases and understand maybe if something went wrong or what the conditions were at that time local weather stations and and also a wave radar so uh, just just to kind of convey the idea that this is a huge data set with a lot of different parts in it um, so before I, I talk more about the the preparation work that we did on all of the equipment particularly on the lidars um, I want to talk just give a few words about uncertainty so that we're all on the same page here um, so the first point is that all measurements that we take are uncertain and um, good measurements would be delivered not only with the measurement data but also with the estimates of those uncertainties and you should really examine the data together with the uncertainties you know together under the under that context um, so it's not simply that you have a number that you believe but you also need to know uh, what sources of uncertainty and and what the scale of where that value should lie in in regards to the true value so we have two types of uncertainties. We have statistical uncertainty, um, and that is, as I wrote, the scatter caused by the fluctuation in the random variables. Um, so that will be dependent on the sample size. The number of samples that you take and average together can reduce the statistical uncertainty. But there's another component called the systematic uncertainty, or the bias, um, and that is, um, as I say, constant non-random unknown error, and that's independent of the sample size. So a nice analogy I like is uh, if you consider measuring a length of something with a ruler, uh, the statistical uncertainty may be the number of times that you uh, that you take that measurement and and look at um, at the you know your es your best estimate of where the true value lies between the tick marks. But um, if you have, for example, a wooden ruler or a metal ruler that might be affected by humidity or temperature, um, it's, it doesn't matter how many times you take that, that measurement, it's going to be different because the, you know, the ruler itself is, is changing its length and changing its... Um, so it doesn't matter how many times you take that, you, you sample that, uh, that measurement, it's, it's going to be biased by by these effects. So one thing that we can do is to um, is to actually try to understand what's causing those systematic uncertainties and try to estimate them. And to what degree we can, we can also try to mitigate them. So the higher the complexity um, and the accuracy that your measurements require, uh, you know, the more careful you need to be in trying to understand and mitigate those. So uh, particularly for the scanning lidars. We, the first thing we did was try to understand all the different uncertainty, uncertainty sources and what uh, impact they're making towards the final result, which, as I mentioned, is the, the wind speed ratios, the relative wind speeds that we're measuring at different points in the site. So um, because the effect of, of the wind farm blockage effect is so small, it's going to be very difficult to measure. So that basically means that our uncertainties need to be 
you know, small enough to be able to form conclusions. The, um, you know, the number that we that we get out of the ratio needs to be smaller than the uncertainty. Otherwise, the whole thing is kind of pointless. And um, what kind of figure we got from the simulations was that this effect was probably somewhere in the range of, you know, between 0.5 and 6% of those wind speed ratios. So the first, uh, the first real step that we did in the project, the first package of work was to was to try to assess if this was actually feasible um, to achieve these goals, to measure with relative wind speed uncertainties below that amount. And uh, we did a, a pretty serious amount of uncertainty modeling and estimations of each component um, to try to understand if this was possible before we committed to doing the project. And then, um, you know, once we completed our preparation work and calibrations, we reran that to make sure that we were still on track. So I've, I've gone ahead and kind of um, listed out the main sources of the uncertainty and tried to group them into different parts. And, uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of describe what we've done in order to, to try to um, reduce the uncertainty, you know, for each of those components. So I've really grouped them into two things. The first is relating to the beam positioning um, of the LiDAR beam. And the second is what I'm calling measurement quantification, or actually how the, the system is measuring. So the beam positioning, um, because the scanning LiDAR uh, has a, a scan head that can move in all directions, um, it's, of course, uh, very nice that we have that capability, but it's also a weakness, because if the scan head is not in the correct position, then we're measuring the wind in the wrong place. Um, so that's something that's very important to control for, and it's a primary source of uncertainty in a lidar in a scanning lidar measurement. Um, and on top of the scan head moving and the beam positioning being diverted from that, uh, we also have the motion of the platform where the lidar is installed, and we need to compensate for that because if we don't, um, as you'll see, and when I go into the tilt of the platform, um, we simply would just have far too large uncertainties. Um, and relating to that, the, the errors that are most critical are the elevation axis errors, and that refers to the height of the beam. Um, and because the wind profile, uh, you know, increase, the wind speed increases with height, you know, normally then we, uh, we really need to be careful about that. And then about the, the measurement quantification uncertainties, um, we of course need for all of the LiDAR systems to function correctly and consistency, consistently to be used together. Um, and a lot of things can go wrong on this operationally or in the data processing. And um, so what we've done related to that is a, a series of onshore calibration exercises uh, that both give um, let us know if there are corrections or deviations between the instruments and also a, a strong evidence if the equipment is working correctly or has, has some sort of failure. Okay, so about the, the lighter measurement quantification um, uncertainties, we mostly have coming from these, these things. The measured line of sight speeds, which is the projection of the wind along the LIDAR's line of sight, the, the beam angle. Um, a distance or a ranging error, which is in a pulse LIDAR because it's measuring at multiple distances. Um, if you have a frequency offset, then what will happen is the LIDAR will think that uh, that basically your measurement range is offset from, from where your target is. So for example, if you think you're measuring at five kil kilometers, it could be that it's off by 100 meters. And by selecting the five kilometer range gate, you're actually measuring 100 meters away from your intended point. So that's a really critical to, to get right. Um, and also timestamps and time zone consistencies, of course, always uh, something that can go wrong with measurements and could seriously impact um, the results that you get from the data. So I'm going to talk a lot about this uh, onshore testing that we've done. And, and the first major point is uh, the intercalibrations, which is a LIDAR to LIDAR calibration. So we're not necessarily calibrating the LIDAR against uh, a reference instrument like a CUP or a SONIC, but we're actually calibrating the LIDARs against each other. And, um, and that's really critical in this project because as I mentioned, we're, we're using relative wind speeds and this allowed us to really reduce the, um, the uh, uncertainty estimate for our line of sight speeds, the first point here. So we've done um, those onshore calibrations and we've also done 
uh, ranging calibrations to check that the range is at the correct position by shooting hard targets. And we've done hard targeting both onshore and offshore. Um, another, another mitigation method that we've used is to compare the, the floating LIDAR data against the um, both the measured line of sight speed from each individual LIDAR and also the reconstructed um, wind vector. And that has given us you know, a strong uh, indication that everything is going correctly and has, has been very valuable to be able to do. And regarding the timestamps and time zones, um, you know, we've used like an NTP, a network time protocol, time synchronization, and also monitored the real-time data to make sure that the time stamps and, and the time zones and everything are consistent between the, between the instruments. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, intercalibration method that we've developed part of this project. And um, the, the core idea here is to install the LIDARs side by side here in the test field and align them to a known reference target, which here we've used the top of a MET mast. Um, and then uh, basically we, we calculate the angle, the azimuth angle and elevation angle such that each beam of each LIDAR is completely in parallel to one another. And um, we set that to be staring at one position and we gather our, we gather our um, observations of the wind you know, with the beams in parallel for a period of a few weeks normally was enough. Um, and then apply some filtering. And then what we do here is to compare each, um, each permutation of pairs between all of the LIDARs. And we come up with a regression matrix and perform a linear regression fit to that and then determine if there are any offsets present in the systems. And, um, and we also achieve a relative uncertainty estimate. From, from that exercise. So <clears throat> we've done that both before the campaign um, at our test facility in Denmark, and we've also done it at the end of the campaign on the island of Helgoland. And we've repeated that process. And I'm gonna show you some results because I think it's very interesting. Um, so the first thing that we wanna look at, of course, is the scatter plots and, and see that everything looks, uh, that there aren't a huge amount of scatter or a trend line that's um, that's not that's indicating that there's big deviations between the two. That looks more or less okay. Um, and when we when we force a linear model and um, uh, when we fit a linear model and we look at the coefficients at the pre-campaign period, um, everything looks very very good, very close to one, which is what we'd expect. Um, but however, when we repeated the experiment. Uh, after the end of the campaign, we noticed that two of the systems, you know, had a gain of you know, almost two percent um, here in in the coefficient, and we were really trying to figure out if perhaps we had done the alignment poorly, or um, you know, or or some some other reason why the systems had are not agreeing anymore in their measurement of the of the line of sight wind speed, and um, one one check we did for that was to check the uh, correlations as a function of distance. And it was it was consistent at all distances, which indicated to us that the alignment was very good, but that there was some problem. Um, so we actually a lot, did a lot of investigation together with uh, the manufacturer of the instrument, Vaisala, and um, they took the systems back to their lab and had repeated a bench test um, simply by isolating the components and, and checking the um, the speed that was measured using a given frequency input. And they found a similar issue that, that there was an offset now present. And um, you can see here that the two that the two methods that the one that we did in the field and the one that was done by the manufacturer in their lab agreed within two centimeters per second. Um, very, you know, it, it matched very well. So it indicates that, that this is a, a really useful um, technique for checking uh, the systems. And anyway, what we concluded was that there was a hardware problem uh, between the two uh, between the two points when we did the test. So um, highly recommend incorporating this this exercise in your campaign. And then we go into <clears throat> to the sources that come from the lidar beam positioning errors. and um, and there's a lot here. <laughs> I'll quickly go through them. Um, so the alignment of the optics and what we've done in order to 
to mitigate that is to check that the beam is centered within the window and that the beam is coming out parallel. The uh, azimuth orientation, so that's the rotation of the system relative to north, and we do that from hard target mapping, um, sea surface leveling, and a new method that I'm that I'm going to go into where we use a drone to actually uh, perform a pointing calibration. Um, we need to correct for the Earth's curvature because um, at far distances, uh, you know, multiple kilometer distances, we will have a height error um, relative to the fact that the Earth is not flat. Um, we also account for uh, elevation and crossing angles, which include uncertainty from the dual Doppler reconstruction. And we do that by an optimization of the LIDAR trajectory. Uh, we perform a synchronization between the dual Doppler systems through, through um, a step stair scan strategy. And uh, we've incorporated a lot of, um, a lot of details into the trajectory that, that optimize um, the, the pointing accuracy of, of both systems together. We also account for the scan head backlash by using um, anti-backlash points which is simply when the, the space between the gears in the scan head, because it's a mechanical system, you have some uh, movement uh, between the gears. And we've been able to, um, to reduce that by controlling the direction in which we move the motors. Uh, and we also have significant um, uncertainties coming from the, the motor offsets in the, in the system. And that's basically if you send the motor to zero, if it doesn't actually go to the zero position, then you you have an uncertainty there, and um, and we've been able to to uh, understand what that offset is and correct for it. And then lastly, as I as I mentioned um, before, the platform is tilting and moving, and and that's something we need to account for. So there's two main there's two main um, types of errors here: a motor offset, as I mentioned, where the lidar is leveled, but it's not um, measuring at the expected position because the motor is not centered at, at the reference point. And the second error comes from a leveling error, which is where the LiDAR itself is tilted and therefore the beam is, is tilted upwards or downwards or on the roll axis as well. So it's, it's important to, um, to separate those two. So what we've done, the first thing is um, because the LiDAR uh, had a low sampling rate and wasn't actually logging its inclinometer data, we've fitted some new sensors onto the LiDAR itself, um, including like the accelerometer here and the inclinometer here. And we've measured that at a high frequency um, and we're using that data for correcting the, uh, the pointing error due to the platform tilt. So just to give an idea of like, of, of this platform tilt problem, um, you know, we have the, the transition piece here and then the turbine tower and the turbine on it and uh, because the turbine is operating, you know, being being um, in the wind, uh, both the thrust effect and, and the windage, and also the the uh, the sea surface, the sorry, the sea motion and ocean waves are moving the whole platform at varying uh, frequencies. We have high frequency effects and the low frequency effects, and it's further complicated on this project because the turbine types are different and the foundation types are different. We have monopile foundation. Um, on Ambram Bank West and a jacket foundation on Nordsee Ost. So the first thing that we did here was uh, before the campaign, we carried out some tilt measurements on both turbine types. And you can see the time series here of the uh, one second average motion of the, two, um, of the two wind farm and turbine types and foundation types. And you can see that they're also different. I mean, they're, they're, the mean is correlated, but there's a lot more high frequency on the monopile than on the, um, on the jacket. So we're looking at a range um, when you average out the high frequency components, deflection range of around 0.1 plus or minus 0.1 degrees on the jacket and plus or minus 0.2 on the monopile, which is it's actually quite a lot. At five kilometer range, um, that's plus and minus you know 17.5 meters height error. So you can imagine that yeah, with the wind shear being what it is, um, it simply will just have a huge impact on you know, at those distances, uh, it will have a very large impact on your uncertainty of your wind speed measurement. So, um, so we we performed that pre-campaign test and came up with with some uh, wind direction average plots like this, which give that range of indication of the motion. So, what we did um, 
after we realized how much the the uh, platform was moving, was we built this um, test rig that can emulate the dynamic offshore tilting onshore so that we can perform our tests you know, in an easier to access environment. Um, so what we did here was to, um, sorry, let me just get this back. Never mind. Well, it's a video showing uh, what we've done where we have one system that's completely on flat ground and another system that's sitting on top of this tilting rig and emulating the offshore um, mo tilting of the of the system as it would be. So we here we put in a sine wave uh, as a simple first test, and um, and, it, and it, yeah, able... the, the video seems not to work. Or... Yeah, I, I think it's related to this pointer. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway. Um, okay. Sorry. But uh, yeah. So what we've been able to do is is to emulate the offshore tilt um, onshore, and then test a series of different algorithms to be able to correct the um, the the data coming out of the system that's tilting and then compare it to the reference data of the fixed system and and that's been um, a really useful uh, exercise as well so the last uh, i think major um, development or, or method that we've come up with in this project is um, is to use a aerial drone um, in order to to do a pointing verification of the lidar so it's really driven because normally we would use hard targets or objects that we can scan, um, but you know they're oft, often unavailable. Uh, and in this case, since we were trying to measure in positions where there are no turbines or anything, there was no possibility to um, to use hard targets to complete the alignment. So we we demonstrated a new method here um, that uh, is able to verify the beam positioning of the lidar. Um, using a drone and as a movable hard target. And I'm, I'm going to walk through a few details of how that works. Um, so the first thing is, you know, you're going to have to be on the site uh, together with the LIDAR and, and bring a drone that has a um, um, high accuracy uh, positioning data. And that's using this uh, differential uh, real-time kinematic space station that you take a very precise position of, and it sends... Um, relative positions out to the drone. And with this system, we're able to get um, get accuracies of the drone position within a few centimeters of its position of its actual position. And um, the, the idea here is to is to fly the drone out into the lidar beam and um, and basically record uh, the time and the position of the drone in which the the lidar detects that the drone is in its in its beam position. Um, and what we can get out of this whole method um, is not only the values and offsets, but also the uncertainties of them. Um, so, of course, we get direct evidence of where the LIDAR is pointing because you can see uh, you can see that in the LIDAR data. We also um, are able to, to see the leveling errors, both on the pitch and roll axis, to, to see if the LIDAR is, um, is leveled correctly. And we do that by, by taking multiple... Um, azimuth positions and are able to then you know, fit a function for seeing if if the uh, if the system is level or not, um, and also elevation motor and azimuth motor offsets. So um, I'll quickly walk through the procedure here, just how how this works. So as I mentioned, you you measure the the position of the lidar scan head and the the drone's base station position. Um, you input that into the controller so that. The, that the drone has the highest uh, measurement position accuracy possible. And then you set the LIDAR into staring mode um, along, ideally along the, the axis that's aligned with the inclinometer. It makes it a lot simpler to, to do the calculations. Um, and then you manually fly the drone. Uh, we use a rifle scope out here, and I don't know if, if you can see that, but the drone is just above my pointer here. And um, we verify that the drone is actually being hit by the LIDAR beam by monitoring data coming from the LIDAR. So if you see the CNR curve here, you see a big peak um, coming at a distance which corresponds to the drone. Um, and you can also see on the range, <clears throat> this is the range uh, time and the CNR intensity, the backscatter intensity. So the periods in which the drone is in the LIDAR beam are here in, in dark blue. And, um, 
and you can clearly see that the that the drone has been um, yeah is collocated with the lidar beam, and then you you extract that data and you repeat this exercise for multiple axes, and the more that you do, you, you know, gives you a better indication of um, of the estimates of all of those parameters. So. Um, so yeah, I think this is a very uh, innovative method, and I I think that um, you know probably won't be necessary for for the majority of measurement campaigns. But in the event that you require an extremely precise pointing accuracy, um, it's it's an option, and we've demonstrated that it works. And uh, yeah, I think it's something we can add to our our toolkit of um, uh, yeah, particularly for for minimizing the uncertainties of these measurements. Um, and just to give a few words, uh, basically all of the that background um, data came into this final campaign design, right? So as I mentioned, um, we have the three pairs of the scanning lidars, and here you can see the beam paths that we've that we've followed, and um, and we're following a step stair uh, strategy, which which reduces the uncertainty due to this the motion when you're scanning. So you simply move to one posi position, stop and measure, and then move to your next position. So you can see the, the strategy that we followed in the top um, path, and you can see how that step stair uh, strategy works by moving between, between the point numbers. So this isn't a continuous scan, it's, it's more or less um, yeah, going between the sequence of points and measuring at those points. And here you can see what we've done in terms of um, minimizing the backlash by by going between uh, between points. Um, this is from the side profile. So we start basically at the first point at the bottom um, as a backlash anti backlash point and travel upwards so that all the subsequent measurement points have been taken with the motors um, moving in the same direction. And that's how we've we've come up with this uh, scan strategy. And um, yeah, uh, I think that's that's basically the um, the details that are important about what we've how we've actually executed the measurements. <clears throat> so uh, once we follow that entire methodology, we've produced um, a very comprehensive, high quality data set that has uh, multiple redundant methods for doing cross checks of the alignment and um, and that the equipment is operating correctly. And I just want to reiterate, reiterate I, I suppose it's probably clear from everything that I've said so far, but these campaigns are, are very um, expensive and difficult to change once they're done. So it's important that you get it correct from the beginning. And of course, most you know, campaigns aren't going to require the amount of, um, of you know, scrutiny that we've needed in this project because of the, the tough demands on the uncertainty. But um, I think it gives a good uh, example for, for how to begin by understanding the uncertainty sources and then you know, what kind of methods that you can include in order to have estimates and, and try to reduce them as much as possible. So um, yeah, I wanna thank all the colleagues that have been part of this project and uh, particularly, yeah, from DTU, TNO, Fraunhofer Evis, RWE, and all the partners that have been a part of the project uh, that have funded and, and supported us. So thank you. And um, I hope you can find this information useful and, and feel free, please, to discuss with me, uh, ask questions or contact me later if you, yeah, if you want to talk about any of the work we've done or, or my opinions about, about these things. Thank you. Okay, thank you very oh. much, Elliot. Yeah, very nice talk. and. Very interesting, and I'm looking forward to to all the results that this uh, data set can bring. And uh, so we, we are open for questions. And uh, if you have questions, then you could raise your hand or and uh, ask, or you can use the chat to to uh, state the questions. But uh, it seems that there's no question right now. So maybe I'll start with by asking. Uh, what what are the plans of, of releasing these data for public use? Yeah, so this was a this was not a publicly funded project. So um, it's oh. a you know 
it, it was a consortium from the offshore wind accelerator who you know funded it and uh, I, I think the answer is that the there are no plans uh, or or obligations to make it public but we are very interested in any um yeah any collaboration that's possible i think we're definitely open to that and you know it's just a matter of having a further discussion about it and mm -hmm. seeing you know yeah. seeing what could be used together then robert has a question yeah hi Elliot. thanks for the presentation really nice work uh, I'm wondering if you also perform sea surface leveling. I would be curious to know how it compares to the drone leveling. Yes, very good idea uh, question. And yes, we did. Um, we incorporated a period of about two weeks of sea surface leveling at the end of the of the project, um, and we were able to to find to basically compare the uh, the motor offsets and the leveling um, and we were basically, uh, it corroborated what we had seen from the drone uh, results and from the hard target scanning that we did. It, it, but um, because this area had, had a lot, has a lot of wave activity, um, the uncertainty on the sea surface leveling was actually, you know, didn't, didn't give us a very uh, fine understanding of, of if it was correct or not, but it did, um, it did, uh, it didn't disagree, I should say. I'll say it like that. Okay, but it sounds that you have more confidence in the drone yeah. method. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Because there's a lot of assumptions that go into that um, sea surface leveling, like the homogeneous wave state and all of that, that creates some issues with, um, you know, when you're averaging over, over the entire azimuth range. Yeah. Whereas the drone is a very small object, you know, at a far distance. Okay. Thanks. And there's a question from Peter Brueger. Uh, is there a publication or report that covers the calibration and error analysis covered by your talk? I did um, make a presentation at Wind Europe Copenhagen last year about that, and uh, and it should be it should be posted online. If you check, uh, if you search for that. Okay, so so the talk is published, or the, the... it's a poster. Uh, poster. Okay. Yes, and and all the details uh, are on the poster, so yeah, it should be pretty comprehensive about how we how we set up the onshore test and how we process the data and discovered the issue, mm -hmm. and then what was required in in terms of correcting the data uh, due to the error, because it wasn't only an error in the um, yeah, in the reduced signal quality, it was also that there was a, an offset introduced by the by the malfunction. So then it was required to identify exactly when the malfunction happened, and then to correct the the line of sight measurements from that point forward. So did you manage to figure out when the malfunction or this extra offset was kicking yes. in, and 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 also the source of it? You know? Yes. Um, so Nasir from TNO did a did a deep investigation into the uh, um, the CNR values across time and how they compared be between each system uh, in the past and also each system at the present time. And there were two clear events where the average CNR um, decreased by about uh, two decibels, and that was connected to some failure in one of the optical components. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why the uh, why the offset um, was introduced. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And then later on, as I mentioned, the Vaisala actually took it back to their lab and uh, found that one of that one of the optical components had um, had a failure and uh, and that and then confirmed the reason and confirmed that the offset was the same as we had discovered. Uh, from our onshore test. Okay, thanks. Um, any other questions, comments to Elliot? May I ask a question? 
This is Elena. Uh, very nice talk, especially interesting the uh, drone control. Uh, we definitely will think about this in our remote sensing group. My question: um, a lidar was on a boat, and what the speed of this boat, or it was stationary when you did drone control? Um, so everything that we did with the drone was was from the turbine platform. Um, oh, it's, it's turbine. Okay. Do yeah, you think so, it will be possible to do it for mobile platform like we have lidars on a truck? It's moving and do this control with drone. It will I be think, more complicated. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't say that's impossible, but uh, the first the first problem that we have is you need a, a fixed reference position, you know, that the drone is mm -hmm. is relative to. Um, and that's this yeah. base station that we have here. So if you could put the base station on the ground and then have the have the lidar moving um, relative to that, that would be okay. But at okay, least thank you you. Know, what we've managed to do with um, with this rifle scope requires requires you to really sit uh, behind the lidar and do it from that. We did actually on our onshore test um, incorporate some autonomous uh, like we would program a flight path that the that the drone would automatically fly but beyond a few hundred meters it was just you just never got a hit and it just took a lot of time so we really think that you know that the manual uh the manual flying is just the easiest way to uh to do it at least right now okay thank you very interesting thanks yeah glad glad you enjoyed thank you elena um, any more questions? I know that uh, that this was a lot of information and perhaps too much, but I wanted to be comprehensive in, you know, uh, in all the different um, steps that we've taken and what we've developed. So, um, but maybe my hope is that question. my hope is that we will can follow up on all of this with um, publications documenting this in detail, and you know if. If you want to discuss more, then I'm happy always to take that discussion. Will you please ask? Oh, you have to unmute. He has also posted a question in the chat. Oh, okay, okay. So, so then we'll try to. Okay, Will. A uh, really interesting presentation, Elias. Thank you. Will be you be sharing the presentation? Well, uh, I can answer that because the whole presentation is recorded and will be shared on NCAR's uh, website. So you just uh, Google NCAR American European American seminar series, you will get it. Uh, and then another thing is the step stair mode scan a standard option for the wind cube scan. Yes. Um, what you do is you make a composite scan of line of sight measurements. So you you basically make a, a sequence of line of sight measurements that it then transverses between. But um, the anti backlash points that I talked about being incorporated um, can also be done that way. But it, it's not a standard thing that is uh, put in. But you, you sort of need to just manually put it in. But it's possible. Thank you, Elia. Um, good. Then uh, any other last question for Elliot? It doesn't seem so. But, uh, Sue, do you remember the, I mean, we have these seminars every second Wednesday of the month. Uh, remember what yeah. we next time? Yeah. Um, the next one is scheduled for February 14th, and I believe we need a volunteer for a speaker that day, and we also have an opening in May. So if anybody uh, would love to volunteer to give a talk in February or May, please be in touch with either Jakob or myself. Okay. All right. But then I would like to thank all everyone and especially Elliot for giving this uh, great talk and thanks for all the questions and then we'll uh, close the session here. Do I have any last comments, uh, Sue? No, thanks so much, Elliot. That was a great seminar and 
um, you know, really kept the level of these seminars series as high as it has been. So thanks much. Yeah. Thank you all. Okay. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.